All right. Welcome to another episode of Let the Be Talk. Today is Monday, September 25th. And uh, thanks for joining the show today. I'm freshly back from, uh, where am I freshly back from? Utah, Boxcar Comedy. And I will tell you this right now. I had a fantastic weekend. What a club. What a, what a great audience and amazing owners. It, it, it just doesn't get any better than what was happening this weekend out there in Springville, Utah. So thank you for uh, new fans and old fans. And thank you to uh, Boxcar Comedy. All the staff was fantastic. The room was great. And uh, at the end of this episode, I'm tagging on a little bonus uh, bonus uh, love that you can catch on the audio version of the podcast. If you're watching the video, it, it won't be on there, but uh, catch the audio version and you can uh, dig into that. Okay, before we go any further, I want to salute, yes, the new Patreoners and old Patreoners that have come back. Let me get, first of all, uh, my good friends Hero Jr., the band Hero Jr., are back out touring, and uh, we'll have them on the show here soon. And uh, they're on the Patreon again. Great, great guys. Known them for years. Been big Del Razor fans. And uh, Joey and I dig their music. Joey Diaz, we we rocked to it on an episode of The Church of What's Happening. That's how I found out about them. So Hero Jr. is out touring around, grinding it in a van, doing it old school, playing live rock and roll. So check them out on the Insta. Let's see who else joined. Um Stephen Wright. Uh, that'd be funny if it was the uh, famous comedian. Yeah, I want to join your Patreon. <laughs> Stephen Wright, who was, uh, uh, by the way, that comedian was one of uh, my favorites early on. I'll never forget seeing Stephen Wright on Johnny Carson. Just unreal. The first time he was on there, just blowing people's fucking minds Still out there, out there. He's got a fantastic book that came out this year. Go dig into that. But that's not the Stephen Wright I'm talking about. I'm talking about a Patreoner, Stephen Wright. Thank you for joining. Christopher Dion, thank you. Well, uh, you know, king in it on the uh, Instagram. He is uh, the Instagram, the Patreon. He is the uh, Patreoner of the month. Christopher D. Dion or Diane. I fuck people's names up. Join the Patreon so I can fuck your name up. It's it's that easy. Forget about those. Uh, what are those things called? Those cameos. Fuck that. Join my Patreon and let me fuck up your name. Anyway, someone's talking in the goddamn background. I got to close this goddamn door. No, Gertie. Gertie's outside. Chilling. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. It's somebody somebody walking by. Anyway, welcome to the show. Lots to talk about today. The first thing on the, on the uh, charts today, on the schedule here, is Bob Dylan played Farm Aid over the weekend. Surprise set with some of the heartbreakers. Steve Ferroni, Ben Mont, Mike Campbell. They got up there and they did three songs, Positively, Fourth Street. Uh, what else did they do? Maggie's Farm. And then they did my favorite of all time, Ballad of a Thin Man, which if you have not seen that version from the Scorsese or Scorsese, however the fuck people want to say it, uh, which by the way, he's got a new film coming out with Leonardo. And uh, I hear Leonardo, this could be, this is funny. How could you be better than anything Leonardo DiCaprio has done? But now they're saying this could be his all-time greatest performance. I'm like, the guy absolutely destroys it in anything. What's eating Gilbert Grape? Uh, what about fucking Titanic? Kid was great in that. He was like a kid who's killing it in that. But of course, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, just destroying that. 
that other one, uh, Catch Me If You Can. Fantastic. Everything this guy does is fucking great. Anyway, so Dylan comes out, starts rocking, surprise guest, blowing people's minds because what he did was he strapped on the guitar for the first time in a hundred million years. That means so much to see Dylan play guitar. You know, it's like back in the day, he would whip out a guitar. He played guitar acoustic, you know, and then, then he goes electric. The whole world fucking changes. He plays guitar forever. And then one day in the Dylan fashion where he doesn't say shit ever, he just starts playing like Fender Rhodes, like electric piano and never plays guitar again. It's got like Charlie Sexton. He's got all the great guitar players. It's not about that. It's just, you know, he's over on the keyboards. It's just not as cool as seeing Dylan up there just strumming. And uh, he even busted loose this crazy, crazy Dylan-esque lead at the end of Ballad of a Thin Man. I was, you know, he's 82. He looks amazing. He's dressed like a fucking, just a, a rock and roll soldier. He's like semi-cowboy Nashville, just cool as shit. And it's like, it's like really loose and dirty, but but the way you kind of want to see Dylan, it's like, wow, there he is with the guitar. He's playing a telly. And uh, it, it was just, what a surprise, man. And I, and he sounded great. He was singing, yeah, you walk in the room. <laughs> Burn, I, probably the only argument we've ever had in our life was he hates Dylan. So funny, we're just, I don't know, like four or five months ago, we were on a, on a plane or somewhere. I was like, Dylan, it's just that he's like, oh, I fucking hate Dylan. Name one good song. <laughs> I get it, man. You know, when you're young, you're not into Dylan. And then I think either you figure Dylan out or you don't. That's just uh, most people's lives in the uh, music world. Either they hate Dylan or they love him. I love Dylan. I love all the different eras of Dylan. I'm obsessed with this incredible plethora of uh, lyrics and songwriting. And I love that he's just out there at 82. People talking about the Stones, uh, people talking about everybody's age. But Dylan really is the king at 82. He does not stop touring. Him and Willie Nelson. They're just at the fucking, they're just like, yeah, we're just on the road again. Just out there forever. It is crazy. You got to love that. You got to fucking love these guys that just are never going to stop. I love it. Anyway, I was thinking last night, I was talking to somebody at the comedy store, which I was there last night. The store is open on Sundays again. It's just great. Come home from the road instead of just laying down and going to sleep like I should. I go to the store and do a spot. And it was fucking fun as shit. Burr dropped in. It was a great night. Sold out room. Anyway, I was talking to somebody about Dylan. And I was saying, how great would it be for him to close his career out back on guitar and just going for it at the highest level, you know, to where people are like, fuck, man. You know, he had like these different eras. And then at the end, he just started rocking guitar again and playing all the old shit. That was the Dylan was playing the old songs and he was playing them like the old songs. He wasn't doing that old Dylan, you know, where Dylan would, you don't even know what song he's playing. He's playing like, uh, you know, like a Rolling Stone, but you can't even tell, which is another Dylan thing. Eh, you don't fucking like how I play him. Get out. Dylan is wild. I'm watching the footage. He's just kind of looking at people. Uh, 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 you know, like he's just like this. He's a, he's a soldier out there. <laughs> it's fucking wild. Anyway, go look at the footage. It's pro shot. It's up there. And uh, it was all for a good uh, cause, Farm Aid, which has been going on a million years. Neil Young played Farm Aid. And uh, now we're going to get into my Neil Young story slash John Mayer slash Ed Sheeran. So... Uh, if you listen to the show, you know, for months, I've been ready for this Neil Young playing the Roxy, playing with the original guys that he played there with, 
back in uh, 50 years ago to the day, the anniversary, you know, he went in there and did the tonight's the night record basically back then and played like three nights or something and just had a great time. They opened up the nightclub. It was, uh, you know, uh, the grand opening back then. And here we are all these years later, Neil comes back. He's still alive. The club is still open and he shows up to play. Now, nobody knows what he was going to do. I figured he would play some stuff from tonight's the night, but I had no idea that he was going to drop the entire tonight's the night record in sequence, then kind of pop off for about 90 seconds, come back out and do everybody knows this is nowhere in sequence. Two of the greatest Neil Young records of all time. It was absolutely, look, I got, I got goosebumps right now. I've been thinking about this show for five fucking days since it happened. Whatever, four days has been, it was on, uh, what, Wednesday or something. It has been beyond mind-boggling to me how insane that was. And it made me think about how great it was that, look, the ticket was $1,000. Uh, it was a lot of money for me. It's a lot of money for 90% of you out there. But I was like, you know what? I don't smoke cigarettes. I don't drink booze. I rarely uh, go to concerts these days. So why not put all of my one year of concert ticket money into one ticket and call it a day? And it was beyond worth it to be five feet away from somebody so legendary and so inspiring. And, and also, uh, I'm going to get into this also with the John Mayer uh, show that I saw that was $536. These were both benefits, okay? John Mayer's was for uh, military, I, I believe PTSD for soldiers. And, and uh, of course... Niels was for his uh, incredible bridge school that he's been doing uh, charity work for, for, I don't know, maybe 30 years, something like that. So it was, they're both for great causes. But the thing I was thinking about it was uh, it almost seemed like the way that I want to see concerts for now on, if, there, if a, uh, an act offered like, a high dollar small show ticket because what was going on was especially at the John Mayer show was there was no talkers. So if the tickets are crazy high price and really hard to get in, the super fans get them and they go in and you don't get that kind of uh random fan, you know, because Ticketmaster, you know, as much as people say, ah, fucking Ticketmaster, they do all this and shit. They do release these kind of $20, $50 tickets or or four tickets for 100 packs. They do that all the time when the shows are uh, huge and they need to fill them up. And then you get these scraggler part-timers in there that are just talking. And uh, I, I witnessed it a lot at the Dead & Co. and the GA. You know, you just get these people in there like, yeah, you know, I mean, Teddy wanted the documents, but, you know, I told him I, I'll get the documents to you tomorrow, man. I'm fucking busy. You know, I, I'm working on these other three things. They're talking work and shit. So, you know, uh, it, it's fucking insane. So to be in these, both these shows, I, I went to see... Uh, John Mayer on a Wednesday. Yeah, it was a Wednesday. And then I think Neil on a Thursday. And, or it might've been Tuesday, Wednesday. I don't know. It's all a blur. But the audiences were fucking primo. I did have one dick at Neil. The, oh, this guy. After each song, crazy horse. He's just fucking yelling it in my ear. I brought earplugs. Uh, but still he was, he was like at the perfect height where it was just pounding my fucking head crazy horse. And he drank like 19 fucking Modellos. You know, those guys, they go to the concert and they got to drink 
the entire concert, they're constantly going out of the crowd to get a beer, then come back into the crowd. You can't go two hours without, you get like, get a couple beers before it starts, drink them and watch the show. Ah, oh, fuck, man. I, I, I can't listen to another song without another beer. This guy drank, I think the amount uh, Neil played was like, what was it? Uh, 17 songs. This guy drank like uh, a beer every other song. What a fucking lunatic. Anyway, Neil, there I am. Incredible in the Roxy. About, I'd say about maybe about four feet from the stage. And they got this beautiful velvet curtain at the, the, at the Roxy. The way the Roxy does it is so great. The Roxy and the uh, Viper Room do this. They've got a curtain down, so you can't see the stage at all. So the band could be up there working with their fucking guitars and looking at their pedals and shit without the audience looking at them. And then when the show starts, the curtain just slowly goes up. And I love that. There's nothing better than that. It's got so much drama and feel, you know? So there it is. The lights go down. People are fucking fired up. The curtain slowly comes up. They start with tonight's the night. Boo doo doo. Tonight's the night. Uh, uh. Bruce Berry was a working man. He used to load that econo line. Dude, head exploding. Head exploding. Neil. Fucking five feet away. Look, I've seen Neil a zillion times, but it's always like at Shoreline or, you know, I've seen him at some smaller places, Warfield and stuff like that. But in the Roxy on a celebration of the 50 year anniversary and you, you have no idea what's about to happen. Nils Lofgren walks out, who was an original uh, guitar player and uh, back in the day with him. You know, he played on Harvest and, and all of that, all of that early shit. And he's singing harmony vocal. And uh, and he's got Willie Nelson's son there. And we got lucky on Nils because Nils is in Bruce Springsteen's band for 100 years. But Bruce got ill and canceled like six shows. So Nils flew out secretly and did this show. So there you are, you're getting the fucking, you got, you got, you know, you don't have Poncho because Poncho retired because he has um, arthritis. He's living out in Hawaii and he just can't play guitar anymore. But you got the fucking Ralph Molina right there on the fucking drums who's 80. Unbelievable, man. I mean, the crazy horse guy, you know, 79, 80 and Neil is 77. You know, and it's just crazy to see it. Oh, man, I'm, I'm just, oh, yeah, I don't want to miss this either. Uh, Neil was playing his original Fender Broadcaster, which was the first telly. They call him the Broadcaster. So 1950, you know, just there it is. Blackguard telly, killer dirty tone, crushing it. On, I had never seen him play that because that was his early guitar. You know, he had a Karina V. I think he still has it, of course. Uh, it, it's so wild to see Neil, you know, have, have his original instrument still. And then he had the uh, the White Falcon. And then he had, uh, then he gets Old Black, that P90, Les, uh, Les Paul, the black one. And, you know, that's the one. And once he plays that, he just plays that for most of his fucking career if he's not playing a, a Martin. But he breaks out. That's a that's a million dollar guitar right there. He's just playing it at the Roxy. It's a million dollars because it's his. But, you know, broadcasters go for big money. I just saw Joe Bonamassa bought a, 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 a nearly mint one from um, Norm's. Uh, rare guitars and he said that he feels it's the second best one in the world and somebody has the first best but he he said it was just incredible but neil's just sounded dirty it was just like da, 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 da. and you know i posted a clip of them playing um uh cowgirls in the sand and it is the blueprint of all grunge as we all know it you know later on him doing 
uh, a record with Pearl Jam, Mirrorball, and and having that full Mach 2 of his career in the grunge world, just schooling people on how it's done. But to see Crazy Horse, it's just insane. Like, I mean, I don't think they will ever play together again. I, I, I really don't think so. You know, Neil's been out with, uh, uh, what are they called? Uh, it's uh, Willie Nelson's son's band, uh, Promise of the New. Uh, Micah Nelson uh, is just unreal. He's up there killing it, singing, sounding amazing, playing some lead, playing a little lap steel. Incredible. And Fast forward uh, or re rewind, not fast forward, but rewind the, the day before when I go see John Mayer acoustic at the Will Turn, which is completely rare. He doesn't play small places. And he announces Ed Sheeran as his opener, as a surprise. Uh, Ed Sheeran, I, I don't really listen to his music, but I would never knock him because th this guy is like one of the he's he's one of the biggest on the planet he just did so fi stadium the same place that motley crew and def leppard played the same place that metallica played the same place that taylor swift did taylor swift did like six nights but ed sheeran did it solo acoustic like 60 70 80 000 people to see him play solo acoustic nobody's fucking doing that nobody man you you tell me who's doing those kind of fucking numbers that's all him that is all his money tons of watch money he, he loves watches but i watched him he opened uh me and my buddy bigfoot went dave i call him bigfoot he's fucking the biggest dude ever he's so fucking tall that it's almost uh it's almost a bummer for me to talk to him because it's just, you know, the fucking neck up the whole time. You know, I had neck surgery. And if I'm not, I'm just staring at his belly button. You know, that, that's how fucking tall this guy is. He's the tallest dude I know. And, you know, he's talking. He's talking about two feet above me. Maybe, yeah, about two feet above me. And it's just going over my head. I already can't hear. <laughs> <laughs> so to talk to this guy is just a fucking bummer and I love him. <laughs> anyway, we went to John Mayer, Ed Sheeran. So we went in and watched Ed's set and uh, he sounded great. Um, I, I mean, uh, I, the, tune, the songs don't really grab me, but he's got a fucking fantastic voice and, uh, and people love him. When he walked on stage, this shit was so loud. The screams, it was like Beatles shit. And then John Mayer came up and the screams were even another level, you know? And uh, it, it was it was a great night. John Mayer just killing. And there it is. I'm looking at it and I'm thinking about Neil Young the next night. And I'm thinking, this is all geared around acoustic music, which I fucking love. But it's geared around Dylan. It's ge geared around Neil Young. And these guys really obviously studied these masters uh you know dylan and neil young and crosby stills nash and young and uh all that early acoustic uh folk music and shit and they've just taken it to a full another level and made uh people my age and younger anyone from my like 20 to 60 loving uh acoustic music which is fucking great. John Mayer killed. Guy killed. He played like three or four of my favorite songs. Uh, three off Born and Raised. A couple off the new record that I really love. And, uh, you know, he uh, he rocked it. He absolutely rocked it. There he was, solo acoustic. And then the weekend, I didn't see this. I was in Utah. But then he played at the Eric Clapton Crossroads and uh, played three piece with the blues band Pino up there on the bass. So a lot of great fucking music in LA in the last week. Holy shit. LA sucks, man.
fuck that place, you fucking libertards and your kick-ass concerts and good food and killer weather. Fuck you. <laughs> mm. Anyway, great, great week of fucking music. And I will never forget that Neil Young show. It was probably the best thousand dollars I've spent in a long, long, long time, man. And uh, I will never forget it. And it, it just really makes me dive into Neil. And just, just fucking, it's just incredible how many great songs that guy wrote with from, you know, uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash, Buffalo Springfield, uh, Solo with the Crazy Horse, everything he's ever done, man. There's so much good music there out of one fucking man. It's crazy. Anyway, thank you, Neil Young. Oh, and by the way, as I was leaving, there's a new mural. If you're in Los Angeles or visiting, you must see this mural that they painted on the side of the Roxy. And whoever did it really fucking kicked ass because I remember the Hollywood Improv decided at one point they were going to paint murals of all the comedians on their walls. And they hired some dude that usually paints whales and dolphins. They hired him to fucking do the, uh, the murals and they were God awful. They were the all time worst. It was so bad that you would be standing in the parking lot at the Hollywood improv and you'd look up and go, well, who is that? And somebody would go, uh, I think that's, I think that's Carlin or, or is it Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top? I'm not really sure. I mean, you could not fucking tell who these people were and they paid big money. And this guy painted these for months and they were just awful. <laughs> I mean, and what really made me, I forgot all about it because they painted over it in the last couple of years. Thank God. It was just so atrocious. Um, but what made me think about how awful it was, was how fucking good this mural is on the side of the Roxy. They painted pretty much. Let me look through my photos of all the people that uh, were on it. It was all the people that had played it over the years and had become famous. And it, it was beautiful. I mean, it was stunning how good the, whoever did it, I'd love to know who did it. I wouldn't mind having them on the grail, actually. I'll find out who did it. So if you look at it, the top left corner, you got Motley Crue. And then you've got, these are all the people that played it. You got Zappa. Oh, and then they got a couple, uh, uh, this is cool because uh, Lou's such a, a big uh, Laker fan. They got uh, Magic Johnson and Kareem painted on there. Then you got The Clash, who played there, a fucking iconic concert. Then you go down, you see Springsteen, Stevie Wonder, Guns N' Roses. Then you see the Ramones, U2. I mean, they're, they're so fucking good. They're like these killer caricatures. Then they got Nirvana. But in the middle of Nirvana, they got Dave Grohl. And to the right of Dave Grohl is Foo Fighters. So you got both. You got Limp Biscuit, Jay-Z. You have uh, Chili Peppers. You have Guar. You have uh, Cheech and Chong. Oh, my God. Pee Wee Herman, Ozzy. I saw Ozzy in there. Motorhead. Uh, you have the... Um, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, Pryor. Oh, Pryor. I didn't even see Pryor when I was there. It's so fucking cool. Uh, Tom Petty, Fleetwood Mac. Um, Neil Young, of course. Or Neil looking cool with the broadcaster in the shades. That's the look right there. Uh, the Doors, unbelievable. Uh, uh, Commodores, Dolly Parton. Who else we got here? It's just endless. Anyway, if you're in LA, spin down there and take a fucking look at that, man. It is so cool looking. And uh, hats off, Lou Reed. I just saw Lou Reed was I was uh, putting it down. So a lot of fucking cool, cool fucking painting uh, murals there. It's so great. And I did eat before the Neil Young show. If you listen to the Grail, I had Josiah. 
on the chef that owns uh, Charcoal on Sunset. And I did eat there and it was a goddamn 10. The steak was phenomenal. If you haven't heard that episode, go listen to The Grail. Also, The Grail this week is Kai Ahrens, uh, an uh, amazing artist and friend of mine. So check out The Grail. The Grail is alive and kicking. All right, big talk. Big talk yesterday was Usher is going to play the Super Bowl. And uh, that is a head scratcher for me. Usher is, uh, of course, Usher great, you know, but he's he's not really, uh, he did the Super Bowl before with uh, some other people, but it's not really, you know, still to this day. And I'm not one of those guys, I can't believe they don't have fucking rock and roll. But this time, I feel like they really dropped the ball on it. Usher is a fine it's, but he's not Super Bowl level, you know, playing. I, I really don't know. I thought for sure this year truly would be ACDC. Being the 50-year anniversary of ACDC, they're playing a gig at Power Trip. I thought for sure this would be one of the uh, marquee dates they can do if they're only going to do five, six dates next year or if they're going to do 10. Super Bowl would be one of the greatest, you know, platforms to show off one of the greatest bands of all time. One of the bands that has been played in stadiums more than anybody would be ACDC. You can't go to a game without him back in black, shook me all night long, uh, hell's bells. Uh, what else do you hear a lot at the game? You hear uh, highway to hell. Da -da -da. There is nonstop ACDC in stadiums since probably around 1980. They've been playing them in stadiums. And the second biggest stadium metal band would be uh, Metallica. How these two acts are not uh, doing the Super Bowl. And I've talked about it every year when they announced the Super Bowl. I did hear years ago that you had to pay to play the Super Bowl now. Now, I don't know if that's still going on, but about 10 years ago, the Super Bowl was like, wait a minute, we're the biggest platform ever. Let's make people pay. And then we'll get a cut of their sales for the next three months because it's going to really skyrocket them back up in the iTunes and the CDs and the and the vinyl sales and all that. And they started putting the word out there, like who wants to pay to play on the Super Bowl? And then people are like, nah, you know? And uh, so I don't know what, if that is still in effect or not, but- how you don't have Metallica or ACDC, maybe the bands don't want to do it. I mean, I saw a fucking James Hetfield doing a, uh, an NBA or NBA NFL commercial yesterday for the Steelers Raiders games. He's like, this is James Hetfield and we're ready for a Steeler nation versus Raider nation. 645, we're ready to rock. I was like, what the fuck? I thought for sure when I saw that, that he was going to announce, and you can catch us at the Super Bowl. But no, it was just James doing a super or a NFL commercial, which is fucking crazy. So anyway, um, you know, there's not really much to talk about that because over the last few years or whatever, I rarely even watched the uh, Super Bowl halftime. I did watch it when it was the hip hop. And, you know, we've gotten some of the greatest shit from the NFL Super Bowl performances over the years and years of it. Prince being the all-time best. Nobody will ever beat Prince. And that's just how I feel. But, uh, you know, it, you're like, okay, well, Usher's going to play all good. I can just go hang out with some friends outside while they're smoking fucking reefer. And uh, we can talk about the game like we care. Like, I think, you know, in the third down, dude, they should have fucking, they should have did this and that, you know what I mean? Um, so anyway, uh, Usher is playing the Super Bowl and that'll give middle America something to be mad about. I said, what is this Usher bullshit, man? I want some fucking docking. You put docking on there. They're the best. Dawkin deserves to play the Super Bowl. <laughs> you know, it's just funny. Every year, it just seems like a Tom Pop had this great joke when I fucking 
first uh, started going out to live comedy in LA years ago. I didn't know who Tom Papa was. And he had this, he's like, why does people, why do people want to live so long? Every year is just the same, you know, Super Bowl, New Year's Eve. And I can tell the joke now because, uh, you know, he, uh, it's long old, but his, his joke is just primo on that, man. It's just a, just a perfect joke. And if you don't know Tom Papa, get into him, man. He's out touring right now doing theaters. I believe he has a book out too. And he is just fucking funny as shit. And oh, he's got a special out on Netflix right now. So Tom Papa, good, good uh, friend of mine, uh, a store staple, open for Jerry Seinfeld for years. And uh, man, get into some Tom Papa. I like to shout out dudes that a lot of people might might not know, you know, um, or maybe you do. If, if you're a true comedy freak, you do know Tom Papa. He's a legend. He's been around. I think he's probably been doing comedy for. 35 years or something and uh he's got a podcast too uh, something something where he fucking makes bread the evil bread which i don't eat <laughs> he loves that bread tom papa a lot of times people confuse me for tom papa yeah we both bald with glasses in our uh late 50s he might be older i'm not sure anyway tom papa i love you buddy so Usher playing the Super Bowl, man. I fucking I can't believe it. I really can't. You know, I'm a huge music head, and I can't even really m remember. Let me look at uh, Usher's uh, tunes real quick, because I can't really remember Usher's music. Because I, I, I remember him being big in the early 2000s, right? Here we go, Usher. Let me fire it up. So, uh, Usher. Looks like he's got a new single out right now. Um, so he's been around for a fucking long time. And uh, of course, I think the big album, let's see, when was the big album? Uh, let's see. I, I, you know, some of these streaming platforms, like I use Amazon. I, I stopped using iTunes because it's just, it's just too fucking antique, you know? Amazon killing it with the HD streaming. 94 is first record out. How fucking long has Usher been around? 94, then 97, next record. 99, the next one. And then 2001, 2004, 2008, 2010, 2012. The guy has been around a million fucking years, but I'm just trying to figure out what his big song was or, it, you know, like what uh, ranks him for full Super Bowl um, halftime. You know, it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. But uh, like I said, it doesn't fucking matter at the end of the day. It's like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, how people get all fucking crazy. Um, you know, they just get nuts over it. It's just, it, it, at, at the end of the day, when you're laying there about to die, you're going to be like, man, I spent about 71 hours of my life arguing about the Super Bowl halftime uh, performances. <laughs> that shit, it goes down into the category of does not fucking matter. You know what I mean? Does not fucking matter. You know what I read on Friday? This was crazy. And I really can't even fucking believe this. Uh, which, by the way, it looks like the fucking strike is over today. Uh, from what I'm reading, man, do we need this strike to end? We need the town to get back going. We got to get the people back working, man. I'm talking about the, you know, the the makeup people, the camera people, the transpo people, all the people with families and all the people that are behind the scenes that you're not even fucking thinking about when you think, oh, fuck them. They're all fucking rich. Those fucking Hollywood elites just want fuck. No, man, I'm talking about the people that make that goddamn shit happen. I'm talking about the, you know, the stylists, 
the carpenters that make the sets, the transpo people, all those union, all of that, man. I'm talking about those people. They need to work. And, uh, you know, they live in this town where it costs a fortune. It's $6 gas right now. It's $3,000 rents. Uh, this ain't no joke, man. So uh, looks like it might end. But what I was reading on Friday, which I had no idea this was still going on until Friday, was that Netflix was still doing the send the DVD out to people's houses in the red envelope, and then you watch it and mail it back. That is how Netflix started. Can you believe what a fucking juggernaut that company became? It is incredible to think how they started. They started by a subscription series where you'd go on, hey, honey, what do you want to watch this week while we're home on the weekend? DVDs, what do you want to get? And, you know, they wiped out, Netflix wiped out blockbusters and all that shit. And then they basically turn into a fucking TV movie studio and become the biggest, the biggest in the biz. It's unreal. So I had no idea they were even doing the fucking DVD still. And I don't even know anybody that has a fucking DVD player. Player. <laughs> player. Whenever I say player, it reminds me of my old boss at, uh, at Van Nuys Harley. Doug. Doug. What was his last name? I fucking know it. Player. <laughs> yeah. Whenever we would be selling a motorcycle, uh, ultra classic that had a CD player, he would just walk by while I'm, I'm trying to sell it to the guy. And he goes, Hey Dean, did you tell him it had a CD player? Player. <laughs> but that might not be funny to you, man. It's just so goddamn deep in my soul of just working at this fucking small Harley dealer in the middle of the summer and having him walk on Doug. Fuck. What is his last name? McGuire, Doug McGuire. Ah, uh, hit me. Poyer. Did you tell me that a CD? Poyer. <laughs> I'm just doing that for my own laughs. I'm doing that right now. My own memory. Just thinking about how far I've come from Van Nuys Harley to you know, going out on this tour bus tour with Bill Burr. That's how far I've come. And it just makes me able to laugh at those great times and bad times of uh, Van Nuys Harley, man. Anyway, I don't know anybody that had a DVD player, man, uh, or has one still. It's really wild. And so Friday, Netflix has stopped the DVD sending and whoever got a DVD sent to them, they just wrote an email and said, feel free to keep it. <laughs> they just want to get rid of those out of their warehouse. So they're like, yeah, you know, don't even bother sending it back. You're all good. You know, what the fucking 2023 people were still getting DVDs sent to them from Netflix. That is, that is a fucking Mind blower. Oh my God. Player. Player. <laughs> I do I want to remind you if you're going to listen to the audio version of this, there's going to be a bonus uh, part of this episode. Uh, so don't miss that. Talking all about Boxcar Comedy Club. Uh, that looks like about it today, my friends. I am so happy that you uh, tuned in. Tour dates are at deandelray.com. A lot of fucking tour dates coming up. I posted them on my Instagram. And um, let's see. This week, I'm going to be in Portland, Maine, two nights with Bill Burr. And then I will be uh, September 30th in Manchester, New Hampshire with Bill Burr. October 1st, Springfield, Mass with Bill Burr. Then October 20th and 21st, I'm headlining uh, at the Great Funny Pages, a new comedy club in Colorado Springs. I cannot wait for that. November 7th, Norfolk, Virginia. November 8th, Atlanta, Georgia. November 9th, Hollywood, Florida. November 10th, let me say this real slow, Madison Square, 
Garden. Holy shit. November 17th, Las Vegas with Burr at the MGM Arena for the Formula One. And then December 20th, I am headlining at the Irvine Improv. So much uh, great work there. And I can't wait to uh, hang out with Bill and Club Soda Kenny. Get out there. And oh, and Jason is going to be the uh, tour bus driver. Remember Jason from the Marcus King tour? Had him on the podcast. He will be driving the bus. Cannot wait to see him again. And uh, maybe I'll uh, get Bill to sit down on the mics on the tour bus and do a little uh, episode. I haven't had Bill on in years. It'd be fun to talk to him or maybe vice versa. He interviews me. I don't know. Also working on shooting a special. It's going to happen. I will be shooting a special. I will let you know the date. And um, I'm going to shoot this shit and fucking it's out of here. I, I need to 2024. I'm going to just try to start all over. I've got a lot of new material and just that's it. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to fucking filter it all over YouTube and dick doc and uh, Instagram and wherever the fuck. Who knows? Maybe someone buys it. I don't give a fuck. I'm putting it out. And uh, and I hope you guys spread it around like fucking wildfire. And I hope I get crazy famous, man. I'm looking to get super famous, dude. I want to be fucking. I want to be famous. <laughs> I'm fucking crazy today. I feel good. I got a lot of sleep last night. All right. I love you guys. Uh, hang out if you're listening to the audio version and check out my interview and talk uh, of all things boxcar comedy in Utah. Candles are lit.